Good morning to some, good afternoon to others, greetings to all. My name is Renee Bryce Laporte. I am a consultant working with Skills for America's Future here at the Aspen Institute. I'd like to welcome everyone to Final Call for Funding, uh, talking about the Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Grants, or TACT grants. Uh, this is part two of our series. Um, if that's what you're looking for, you are in the right place, please. So I'd like to give everyone sort of an overview of what we're going to be covering today, a uh, table of contents, if you will. Um, we will be doing a quick overview of Skills for America's Future and an overview of the session today. Um, and then we'll do a brief interview with a uh, representative from the Business Roundtable. And then we will have two different panels of uh, presenters here, uh, we, uh, speaking with uh, two employer association partners, and then we'll have a Q&A period, and then be speaking with another group of uh, employer association partners, and we'll have a second Q&A period. Um, at the end of this call, we'll have some links to more information that you can access to uh, help uh, provide background to you as you look to form partnerships and apply for grants. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to John Colborn, who is the Director of Skills for America's Future. John? Thanks, Renee, and let me echo Renee's welcome uh, to all who are participating in today's webinar. This is one of a series of webinars that is sponsored by Skills for America's Future to share best practice information with employers, community colleges, and workforce development professionals. Skills for America's Future is a program of the Aspen Institute that seeks to foster community college efforts that advance economic opportunity for U.S. workers and competitiveness for employers. We seek to foster employer and community college partnerships to advance these goals and manage a series of action research, capacity building, and policy-focused projects. Jackie, if you can advance the slide. Um, earlier this month, Skills for America's Future presented a webinar focused on two state-focused options in the SGA uh, that provided for additional funding under the solicitation. These included uh, options that would address uh, uh, career pathways and uh, have those work at the state level, and improving data integration and use uh, in community colleges and across uh, states. Today's webinar focuses on the third option, partnerships with business and industry associations around industry-recognized credentials and competencies. Applicants uh, selecting these options are eligible uh, for higher budget caps under the SGA, and that's illustrated on this next slide here. Our aim is to encourage prospective applicants to consider partnering with business and industry organizations to expand or enhance pro programs resulting in employer-designed de uh, certifications. Uh, we are providing expert advice from national business organizations who have long experience with this issue. One thing I just want to note, this is not an applicant webinar of the sort that's provided by the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, DOL is the only official source of guidance for the grant solicitation, and I encourage you to review all the resources available on the DOL website uh, for um, uh, nuts and bolts issues about the SGA. Finally, I want to acknowledge the American Association of Community Colleges, our, our key partner. AACC's 21st Century Initiative efforts on the skill gap is closely aligned with the topics of today's webinar. With that, I'm going to return you to Renee. Uh, who will MC us through the rest of the webinar. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. So the next slide, please. I'd like to welcome to the call Dane Lin, who is Vice President of Education and Workforce at the Business Roundtable. Uh, Dane, are you there? I am, Renee, and let me know if at any point you can't hear me. Wonderful. So far we're hearing you just great. Um, so the next slide, please. Dane, could you tell us just a little bit about the Business Roundtable and its interest in workforce development? Sure. Uh, thanks, Renee. The Business Roundtable, I think it's important to know, is, is governed by a structure of committees, and I staff the Education and Workforce Committee for the BRT. Uh, the chair of the committee is Rex Tillerson, and the vice chair is uh, Eric Spiegel, the CEO of Siemens North America, who as vice chair is really focused on the workforce development uh, component of our work. And I think it's fair to say, you know, for those of you that know the BRT historically, we have done a lot of work on K-12. And we've dabbled into the workforce space, but I, I would suggest that our involvement in the national network that we're going to talk about and some other related work that is 
for another day, another time, um, is really ramped up our work significantly in the workforce space with a focus on um, with a focus on the skills gap broadly defined, but really trying to help employers understand that it's. It's important to talk about the skills gap and the supply problem they have, but more importantly, it's, it's critical that employers, our member companies, and CEOs get directly engaged on the solution side in trying to fill the, the skills gap. Hey, um, Dane, could you do me a favor? Um, just in case folks aren't familiar with BRT, can you tell, tell them just who are the members? Sure. The BRT has um, approximately, well, approximately, we have exactly, 210 members. Uh, they are the well. The CEOs um, represent major uh, or Fortune 200 companies in the country. It's not the company that's a member of the business roundtable. It's the CEO, him or herself. And so our our committee structure, our organization, is really guided um, by the CEOs who are members of the organization. And again, they represent Fortune 200 from from ExxonMobil to Walmart to Accenture to State Farm, and they represent, they represent um, virtually every sector in the economy from healthcare to energy um, to uh, financial services, and the list goes on and on. Great. That's helpful. I just wanted to make sure folks understood the, the pretty strong reach that BRT has. Uh, could we get – oh, you, you move to the next slide. So, uh, Dane, BRTs joined with ACT Foundation to establish the National Network of Business and Industry Associations. Could you tell us just a little bit about the network and its objectives? Sure. Well, we're really thrilled to, to be working with the ACT Foundation and co-leading this effort. But I think even more, uh, more importantly to the Business Roundtable, we're very excited about the partnership we've created with the network associations, some of whom you're going to hear from later on uh, during this call. It's an opportunity for us, uh, from our perspective at least, for us to bring together the business community and try to work not just collaboratively, but work in unison to develop a set of strategies that serve all of our respective members. Um, from, you know, we represent the Fortune 200, but many of these participating associations and their members represent other uh, or smaller companies in, in the country. But, for us to have an opportunity to bring together the employer community and to develop tools that assist our members, and I think even most critically, to think about the solutions that it's going to require at scale. Because we, do a lot of, we do a lot of work independently of one another, um, and we create lots of islands of success. But if we could use this national network as a way to address the skills gap issues that we have today, as well as look, looking forward uh, or thinking about what the future holds, I, mean, I think we have an, an opportunity to build an infrastructure, if you will, that is sustainable over time. You know, we talk a lot about uh, here at the BRT the 4 million jobs that are currently open. And you know, not everyone in this, in this culture of everyone's got to go to college, not everyone's going to need to or want to go to a four-year college or university. And the way and the data that we see, not everyone really needs to get a high-wage, high-skilled job and maintain the quality of life that requires that, that, that BSBA degree. Um, there are many different pathways. And the opportunity this network holds is to, to create a pathway that has been in existence, but to improve upon the, those pathways and increase the credibility in the eyes of the consumer. And the consumer for us is not only the student, but for the, for the high school students, for the parents. We need to build stronger credibility uh, for these types of pathways in the industry-recognized credentials. And I think we also want, as part of this network, to, to give employers an opportunity to play a much more direct role in helping define what are those core competencies for the range of industry industry certif certifications that exist or may come into existence in the future. And the, uh -huh. the last, is, the last uh, objective for us is to use this network to build much stronger partnerships with the community colleges across the country. They are the backbone of regional and state economies. 
And it's not to disregard, you know, disregard the four-year colleges and universities, but the community colleges play an essential role in trying to rebuild this economy. And Absolutely. if we can figure out ways to, to create stronger partners, partnerships through this network, I think we'll be, uh, we'll be all, all that much more uh, better off. The last thing I would say, uh, Renee, is that we have a lot of companies doing great work. And one example uh, would be the apprenticeships that some have created. But I would also suggest there's a lot of room for improvement in the work our companies are doing. There's a lot of one-offs. And mm -hmm. you know, an example of that is our companies <clears throat> tend to look at apprenticeships as the only work-based model. And we need, to, we need to expand their point of view about what constitutes work-based learning, what are the range of options, and specific to apprenticeships, what do good apprenticeships look like? Quality apprenticeships that will actually prepare individuals, whether it's the high school student or the adult learner who's employed or not employed, to, to, take, to make sure they're ready for the jobs that they'll eventually take. Great. Hey, um, go to the next slide, please. Dane, we have about a minute left uh, in, in this session, section. Could you let us know, uh, this round of uh, TAC funding includes a special emphasis on working with business associations and industry certifications. Uh, what kind of activities and outcomes would you hope to see from TAC grants in this round? Well, I think for us most importantly, uh, we need stronger employer engagement in the TAC grants. Uh, you know, there have always been partnerships uh, as a required element of, of the TAC grant, but you know, partnerships on paper and partnerships in reality are two different things. And one outcome that we would like to see, uh, and we've been encouraging our members, is to uh, take the initiative and reach out to your community colleges. Tell them at PG&E the work that you're doing out in California and Oregon, and figure out whether or not you could scale up what you think, based on data, is a proven practice. So we want stronger uh, engagement in our members taking the initiative to apply in partnership with the community colleges uh, for these grants. And I think we want, we hope these TAC grants are an opportunity to increase more meaningful engagement by employers in a direct uh, uh, in response to the needs we have to fill these roughly 4 million jobs that are currently open but also the jobs that are projected to be open in fields like data science. Got you. Hey, Dane, thank you very much for this. Um, I think this is a very helpful overview and for folks to get some of, uh, idea of what the Business Roundtable is at and get a larger uh, perspective on this, uh, these grants. So thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So now we'd like to move on to some of our industry association partners. Um, we'll be asking a series of questions to them. Uh, first one up is Maureen Lamb, who is the Executive Vice President at the National Apartment Association Education Institute. Maureen, are you there? I certainly am. Great. Uh, could you have the next slide, please? So Maureen, could you tell us a little bit about the National Apartment Association and who you represent? Sure, I'm pleased to. The National Apartment Association represents the owners and property managers of over 7 million apartment homes across the United States. Today, about 35% of U.S. households are rental households, which means that nearly 35 million Americans call apartments home. It's also projected that over the next decade, the number of renter households will increase by about 500,000 a year. So. Um, you probably have noticed uh, this growth in your local communities. If you see a lot of cranes in the ground where they're building um, new construction, a high percentage of those cranes probably are building apartment communities. The two fast-growing population segments that are driving this demand for apartments are young adults in their 20s and empty nesters in their 50s or older. Great. That's certainly true here. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? So what kind of jobs do you have available, and how do they lend to community college training? Well, the apartment industry has three career tracks for um, people who work on-site at apartment communities. 
we have a, an apartment maintenance track, an apartment leasing track, and an apartment management track. And um, to date, we've success successfully worked with about 28 community and technical colleges across the United States to provide workforce training for apartment maintenance technicians as well as for apartment um, leasing consultants. A num those colleges have used our curriculum. Um, the National Apartment Association Education Institute has an ANSI accredited certificate for apartment maintenance technicians. And that certificate um, has uh, coursework or curriculum that covers about 90 hours of hands-on training. And that hands-on training covers plumbing, electrical, HVAC, appliance repair, and indoor and outdoor maintenance. On the um, leasing side, we have a, another certificate program, the National Apartment Leasing Professional Certificate. And that covers um, everything related to leasing, um, everything from you know, how to answer the telephone, how to capture online leads, how to um, resolve objections, um, a lot of sales techniques. In, uh, two, in 2013, apartment maintenance turnover in our industry was 35%, and apartment leasing turnover was 30%. So on top of the new um, construction that we see in the industry, you can see through turnover that there is great demand for skilled workers to work in leasing and in apartment maintenance. Got you. So could I have the next slide, please? So given that, um, those are the kind of jobs that you have and that community colleges can help you help uh, its students prepare for those jobs and get certification so they can move into those jobs. How might community colleges best partner with you to prepare students for industry recognized credentials and in-demand jobs? As I mentioned, we have had about 28 um, partnerships and what we found is the most successful partnerships are where we have, uh, can link up our, one of our 160 state or local affiliated apartment associations with the local community college and with our local members. Uh, what we found that um, this provides a richness. You're not just using our curriculum, but you're bringing in people who work in apartment maintenance or work in apartment leasing or are hiring people to work in those positions to conduct apartment tours. Uh, to offer job shadow opportunities, to offer work-based learning. Um, they serve as guest industry speakers. And they also, the most critical component is, will participate in career fairs to hire the people who have been through and successfully completed the training. We've also found that with, with some community colleges, they've combined our um, Certificate for Apartment Maintenance Technicians with IBEST. And they, that, um, that venture has proved to be successful. We're still tweaking it, um, but we've learned quite a bit. And anyone who, are, who offers iBEST and would be interested in um, teaching iBEST and our maintenance training, um, we can put you in touch with a community college that has been working on this and has found some success. And uh, we've also partnered with Goodwill Industries and our community colleges. And that's really been helping people who have been out of the workforce for a number of years and need to re-engage and they need that support system on top of learning um, skills and competencies. That's great. Thank you very much for that, Maureen. Um, and we will perhaps come back to you with some questions from the audience uh, after our next speaker. Thank you for participating. Um, next, I'd like to bring on Steve Kramer, who is the Vice President for Communications at the National Restaurant Association Education Foundation. Steve, are you there? I am here. Thank you. Welcome, Steve. Steve, could you tell us a little bit about the National Restaurant Association Education Foundation and who you represent? Sure. <clears throat> I'm happy to have the opportunity. The National Restaurant Association Educational Foundation works in concert with the National Restaurant Association. About 500,000 uh, restaurant owners and operators as well as uh, suppliers to the industry. <clears throat> we have a workforce now of about 13 million um, that we um, offer training um, through. Uh, you may be uh, familiar with the Serve Safe certification mm -hmm. program um, that's really recognized nationally and used nationally 
um, by 75% of restaurateurs and even schools. Um, we have a managed first uh, curriculum that we work with about 350 community colleges across the nation and, and also um, and probably most prominently our ProStar program, which is <clears throat> a secondary school program in junior and senior year of, uh, of high school that reaches 100,000 students each year at more than 1,700 uh, high schools around the nation. So really we're the workforce development uh, arm of the National Restaurant Association. Great. So uh, what kind of jobs do you, you are available in your field and how do they lend to community college training? Yeah, I think, um, you know, if you traditionally think of, um, you know, front of the house, back of the house type jobs within the restaurant sector, you certainly have, um, you know, the wait staff and, and um, culinary, but you have um, robust business operations as, as part of any uh, restaurant, whether uh, independent, uh, small operator, or a larger chain. So anywhere from payroll and benefits managers to um, restaurant managers themselves, marketers, um, chefs from uh, culinary to pastry, um, you have crew leaders, you have um, HR trainers, um, you have regional supervisors, so um, we really we really um, take from every uh, discipline uh, within um, a, you know a management setting and apply that to restaurant operations. So there's um, quite a connect to uh, post secondary degrees and, and the need for post secondary degrees in our industry, as well as um, you know entrepreneurship, which is taught through you know, anywhere from a secondary program to a post-secondary program. That's sort of the heartbeat or the hallmark of our industry. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think the, those are a handful of, of careers that we um, see a, a great connect with the post-secondary system. Great. Thank you. Um, can I get to the next slide? Thank you. So, Steve, how might community colleges best partner with you to prepare students for industry-recognized credentials and in-demand jobs? I think in any number of ways. We operate through um, a network of state restaurant associations, which then um, coalesce the, the members, if you will, of the National Restaurant, Restaurant, National Restaurant Association at the local level. So we have 50 state restaurant associations that um, are our local grassroots network. And there's any number of ways that um, we see a, a connect uh, through this grant opportunity and working with community colleges, whether that be as a subject matter expert, uh, assistance in the development or design or review of a curriculum um, geared towards the restaurant or hospitality sector, um, instructional support to faculty in order to integrate standards into new or existing community college programs. Um, as well, I mentioned the, the state uh, restaurant associations. We have employer members that uh, you know, are ready and available to offer job placement opportunities, work experience, internships, um, on-the-job training. That's, a, that's our local connect. Um, as well, we um, are, are in the position to conduct studies uh, or assess the need for new credentials in the restaurant sector and build pathway models um, that demonstrate um, the great upward trajectory that's offered in our industry. Um, and I think finally, you know, developing, um, helping to develop competency-based assessment tools to align, you know, knowledge, skills, and abilities of workers to occupations in the food service or restaurant industry. Great. Thank you for that, Steve. Um, I'd like to let everyone know that we are about to have a Q&A session uh, uh, for uh, Maureen and for Steve. Um, and if you have questions, you can chat them into your, your screen and we will look at them. Um, I have one or two that are listed here um, already. Um, and I'd like to ask, I guess this was typed in for Maureen, but I think it's also applicable for Steve. Uh, what kind of annual wages do people earn in these positions, the positions that you have open? I'm happy to um, go first. This is Maureen. Sure, um, in, sure Maureen. In our leasing positions, um, the, the starting annual salary would be, be about $30,000. And as people move to larger apartment communities or move up in title from leasing consultant to leasing manager, their, um, their wages would increase to about $60,000. On the maintenance side, again, people would start at about $30,000, and that's, it, that is an, 
um, median for salary for the United States. Um, some regions are higher than that. And you could work your way up from maintenance technician to regional maintenance manager. And regional maintenance managers can make as much as a, over $100,000. So these are um, positions that if, you, if you've got um, a great attitude and you take advantage of all the training, you can really work your way up to some really good salaries. And I should also mention that there's a rent benefit with many companies where if you choose to live in one of their apartment communities, you can receive 20% or more discount on your rent. Great. Uh, Steve, any response? Yes, thank you. Um, you know, I think from a culinary standpoint, you know, chefs um, earn anywhere from um, the mid to, to high 30s to 50 or $60,000 depending on a uh, level of experience. Management level jobs um, start at the same level, I would say, and then really move up um, as, as you move up the, the opportunity chain within our industry. Um, our industry really rewards um, hard work, uh, rewards experience, and we have survey research that shows that um, a majority of our uh, workforce gets a raise within six months, mm -hmm. and then um, there's great flexibility within the industry from, to move from one restaurant to another or one company to another because of the vibrancy of the industry. So there are good wages um, for those that come in with experience and also with, uh, with degrees. Thank you. Hey, um, Maureen, in, in your responses, you made a reference to iBEST. Uh, just in case anyone uh, doesn't know, could you give like 10, 15 seconds on what iBEST is? Yes. Um, I believe that there are about 10 states in the country that have adopted iBEST. It started in Washington State, and it stands for Integrated Basic English Skills Training. And what um, ha ha this program has been conducted at Montgomery College in Maryland. And while the students are learning maintenance, apartment maintenance skills training, they are also learning English skills. And um, that, that program has, um, is going to be adopted by a couple of other community colleges in, in Maryland as well. So, um, the, so far we've found that we've been able to place a number of students um, who graduated from the program it right away into um, into some of the positions with the start. Actually, the starting salaries in Maryland are higher than I quoted. Um, uh -huh. But but we have found that there are still some students that, because of their um, their lack of English skill and um, their difficulty in interviewing, they're going to need a, a little bit more training in order to be hired as a full-time employee. So we have um, partnered with a local employer who has offered to take six students who graduate from the IBEST program um, into an internship program with their company where they'll be paid a stipend and the goal is to hire them as full-time employees after they have had that opportunity to complete their internship and have met so, the competencies that have been set. So Maureen, um, are those iBest pathways that lead to the $30,000 positions you mentioned in leasing and maintenance, or they lead to a lower level at first? No, it, they're, they're leading to um, those, that 30000 or up um, that I mentioned before. But there, are, there still will be a, a, a group that probably needs, some, um, needs that internship to be able to make them um, help them develop the skills they need to get hired as a full-time employee at that 30000 range. Now, have either of you uh, previously partnered on a tax grant, um, either the associations or, or your members? And are there any lessons to be learned if so? Uh, we have not partnered on a tax grant. So this is industry. new for you? Yes. Uh, Steve, is this new for you all as well? It is indeed. Okay, well, we're glad to have you on board for sure. Um, are the community colleges creating certificates in areas of local need? Uh, you know, that's something that folks are interested in for grant support. The, um, the, you know, the community colleges that we have worked with are, um, they've adopted our certificate and our, they're offering um, the industry certificate. 
And it's based on the fact that there are there is such a dire need for these employees in that area. Got you. Yeah, I think I think from the restaurant standpoint, our Manage First program is really geared towards the community college. So we have about 350 that have adopted that. Um, but I think you know the industry is is great is the largest creator of jobs in our economy right now, and that will likely will continue. Um, we're on the, um, I think, the 60th consecutive month of doing that. Um, so I think there's a great need for uh, management level positions that uh, you know, our post-secondary partners and new partners uh, under under this opportunity uh, will see a, a really very good connect with our industry. Um, and the last question for both of you is: How do community colleges connect with lo local affiliates of your national organizations? How, how would they manage that? I would suggest that they come through me because the best thing is um, we have a full-time employee here at the national level who uh, is working with those local associations and with the com local community colleges to help facilitate. We, you know, as I said, we've um, worked with 28 colleges, so we've ha we have a lot of lessons learned. And I think by c tapping national and we help guide at the local level, um, we're going to get the best results. Great. Um, Steve, it's similar true for you to go through you, or how would they connect with local? Yeah, absolutely. As with Maureen, um, if they would, con they would connect with the National Restaurant Educational Foundation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do um, work uh, very diligently with our state restaurant association partners, um, have direct lines to them. They, uh, they manage our ProStar operation at the secondary school level. Um, uh, with over 1,700 schools, so we have great experience in doing that, and um, I can be the funnel uh, to those local, uh, those state programs and then local programs. Thank you for that. And I'd like to let everyone know, again, that at the end of this session, you will have access to a resource sheet, and we do actually have contact information for the organizations that are participating here on the call today and a few others. So with that, I'd like to thank Steve and Maureen for their participation and sharing information and sharing the ability to access them. So uh, your participation is much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, with that, we're going to move on to our next group of panelists. Um, first up will be Paige Browning, who's Vice President of Academic Services at Home Builders Institute, or HBI. Paige, are you there? I am. Thank you. Wonderful. Can we have the next slide? Thank you. Could you tell us a little bit about HBI and, and who you represent? Yes, um, HBI or Home Builders Institute, we're a 501c3 corporation based in Washington, D.C. We are a national leader for training in the building industry. Um, HBI training programs are taught in local communities across the country to youth and adult populations, to veterans, um, ex-offenders, and displaced workers. So we really uh, are across the board. Um, HBI also offers products and services, including textbooks and industry-recognized testing to high schools, career technical schools, and community colleges nationwide. Um, we are an affiliate of the National Association of Home Builders, uh, and they have 140,000 members and between seven and 800 uh, home builders associations in local communities across the country. So really this connection provides us a pathway for students to obtain employment after graduation as the other speakers have mentioned. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that NHB also offers student membership, and HBI has a very close relationship with that program. Ah, great. Wonderful. Could I have the next slide? So what kind of jobs do you have available, and, and how do they lend to community college training? Well, um, NEHB analysis shows that building 1,000 um, average single-family homes generates nearly 3,000 full-time jobs and $162 million in wages. Um, and according to census reports, uh, for March 2014, residential construction made up 54% of all private construction dollars spent um, uh, in March of this year. So the HBI side of it, our products and services provide a career path for students. Um, and really, we try to say it's not just a single job after they graduate. Um, over 100 jobs are created by building a single home 
and companies are obviously in need of skilled tradespeople as the other speakers have mentioned. Um, HBI really focuses on the trades and also um, the supervisor part of the jobs. So starting with the trades, we have this uh, series of, of materials called the Residential Construction Academy Series, and it's textbooks and teaching materials in um, carpentry, electrical principles, facilities maintenance, wiring, HVAC, masonry, plumbing, and then some green applications for residential construction. And this whole series was developed from national skill standards set by NHB industry professionals and educators. And then with the series, we offer student certification in the following trades, which is um, carpentry, basic principles, facilities maintenance, house wiring, HVAC, and plumbing. And so for those that might be interested in site supervision, HBI offers uh, the residential construction superintendent uh, designation, which is also an industry recognized designation for supervisors. That's great. Thank you. So um, how might community colleges best partner with you to prepare students for industry recognized credentials and in-demand jobs? Well, HBI, we have over 40 years experience in partnering with local entities to provide resources and training. Um, we have the basics. We have the industry recognized RCA series, the student testing that's all based on national skill standards, and we have the industry recognized superintendent designation training. Uh, we would be happy to be creative with your, you know, any college um, interested to determine what best fits the needs. Um, for example, if you're interested in apprenticeship, HDI uh, licenses its pre-apprenticeship certificate training curriculum, and additionally, um, HBI's apprenticeship guidelines for carpentry, electrical, HVAC, and facilities maintenance are certified for, by the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Apprenticeship. Um, we've you know, kind of brainstormed on some other ideas of how to get involved with the schools. Uh, we've thought of creating an online gaming simulation of building a home from getting the permits to the sale of a home. Um, we actually have developed a mentoring guide that can be repackaged and even digitized for use in community colleges. Um, another um, big element might be to incorporate the NAHB Green Building Standard in the classroom. It's an ANSI approved um, standard and it's closely connected to the RCA series. And then um, putting the superintendent and the advanced superintendent coursework um, online for students and faculty may be an idea. We're certainly not limited to these ideas, but we, we welcome a conversation. Thank you for that. Um, and we will circle back to you, more, uh, I called you Maureen, circle so back to you, Paige, <laughs> um, as soon as we're done uh, with the other panelists. So thank you. So next I'd like to bring on Jim Wall, the Executive Director of the National Institute for Metalworking Skills. Welcome, Jim. Are you there? Uh, yes, I am, Renee. Th thank you. Thank you. So Jim, will you tell us a little bit uh, about NIMS and, and who you represent? Well, the, the National Institute for Metalworking Skills, or NIMS, uh, was formed in 1995 by uh, a consortium of metalworking trade associations to develop uh, and maintain... Next slide, please, Jackie. I'm sorry and help uh, ensure that we maintain a globally competitive American workforce. Um, our job at NIMS is to convene uh, the industry stakeholders uh, to develop uh, skill standards for the industry. We also certify uh, individual skills against the standards and accredit training programs that meet the NIMS uh, quality standards. Uh, NIMS continues to be an industry-driven organization that tries to bridge the gap uh, between educational institutions and the industry by providing a common language to tell schools, students, and workers exactly what they need to know to be successful in a, in a variety of uh, precision manufacturing occupations. Uh, next slide, please. So what kind of jobs do you have available there, and how do they lend to community college training? Uh, there's numerous job openings in our industry. Uh, metalworking, metal forming, and machining underlie the entire manufacturing sector. Uh, the, the companies in our industry represent many sectors and manufacture uh, metalworking equipment, molds, tools, and dyes, medical equipment and devices, and uh, just a variety of uh, machine components. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, in fact, you know, today there are roughly, um, it's projected to be uh, roughly 100,000 job openings for machinists and CNC technicians and, you know, roughly another 115 or 120,000 projected job openings in industrial maintenance mechanics. Um, and uh, uh, increasingly, employers are in demand of workers with these skilled skills and um, and also individuals are seeking to value, uh, validate their skills and differentiate themselves in the, the hiring process through industry-recognized uh, standards and credentials. Um, as, as manufacturing com becomes more complex and technology-driven, uh, companies and workers and students need to, to keep up with the industry standards and the jobs requirements. Great. Next slide, please. So, Jim, how might community colleges best partner with you to prepare students for industry-recognized credentials and in-demand jobs? Okay. Skills in, in the precision manufacturing and metalworking industry are certified through the earning of NIMS credentials. Uh, the credentials are awarded uh, based on the satisfactory completion of both a performance requirement and also related theory exams. The, these assessments are standards-based. That, that means they're drawn from the NIMS National Metalworking Standards. Uh, both the performance and the theory exams are developed by the industry and piloted in the industry. Um, the, the NIMS certification requires, as I said, both the performance and the theory exams. And the performance is typically will require the manufacture of a part or the setup and operation of a machine or the writing of a program to manufacture the specific part. Um, the NIMS standards are modular in nature um, and that allows uh, the credentialing based on specific processes and or levels of, of competency, if you will. Uh, for example, there's 11 distinct credentials in machining level one. Uh, overall in our system, there's 52 different credentials. And the, the credentials enable the employer to assess uh, candidates uh, in the skills that are most applicable to the firm's needs and the training institutions to measure the, the program performance, which is tailored to their local industry's needs as well. Great. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, so we're going to uh, come back to you, uh, Jim, uh, so when we're done with the next can, set of can questions. We, can we? Oh, oh, you want to go back to the next, last yeah, slide? Could, could we go back to that last slide so I can add? Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, go ahead. Oh, we missed a piece there. Um, uh, at NIMS, we're prepared to partner and help the TAC grantees uh, meet or exceed their performance expectations, um, including enhanced curtainal, uh enhanced credential attainment, completion of uh, programs, and improved employment opportunities for participants uh, and increased earnings. Uh, we have a partnership opportunity packet that's available and we stand uh, ready to provide a letter of support to discuss a partnership agreement. Uh, we, we are suggesting we have five uh, avenues for partnership. Uh, number one being that we suggest building in an opportunity for the support of and the establishment of a comprehensive certification program tied to employment. That's a key requirement in this round of, of the, the SGA. Um, a comprehensive certification program provides community colleges with the opportunity to issue NIMS certifications to TAC grant participants um, in order to foster improved employment and earnings outcomes. By establishing NIMS certifications at a local community college, the tech outcomes uh, will be improved with the following ways. Number one is the improved credential attainment. Uh, each of the NIMS credentials issued to a, to a tech uh, recipient a participant uh, counts towards the total number of participants earning credentials measure. Um, number two, improved participant employment. Uh, because NIMS credentials are portable and recognized nationally by employers, the tech participant employment outcome will be enhanced and NIMS certification will assist the community colleges with a higher number of participants meeting the total number of participants employed uh, outcome measure. Uh, Number three, the improved earnings. Uh, the NIMS certifications improve the, the level of skills and competencies attained by the, the TAC uh, participants. This increased portfolio of skills and competencies typically qualifies TAC participants for higher level skilled jobs and higher wages. NIMS certifications will assist community colleges with improved outcomes for the total number of participants 
who received wage increased uh, post enrollments for incumbent worker participants. We're also able to provide instructional support to faculty in order to integrate the NIMS standards and credentials into the course design and educational pathways. NIMS can provide uh, subject matter expertise in partnership with the community college faculty and staff involved in delivering the curriculum and courses to the students, uh, activities, and deliverables tied to this include uh, you know, a greater understanding of NIMS standards and certifications and the curriculum alignment methods. Uh, they will receive a working knowledge uh, for the, the trainees to uh, credential uh, the trainees and the students. The faculties could have the opportunity to earn uh, up to the 11, level one uh, machining credentials. They would have the ability to implement testing uh, procedures and, and the policies so to, to enable the program to seamlessly integrate it into, into their, their offerings. Uh -huh. And uh, for the we could also help with uh, assisting with the curriculum design and the review to ensure that it, it's aligned with the national industry standards. Um, and we're, we're also well positioned to work collaboratively on employer engagement strategies to ensure recognition of NIMS credentials in the recruitment retention policies of, of companies. And given that our stakeholder base includes over 6,000 metalworking companies, the major trade associations in the industry, uh, substantially supported the development of NIM standards and credentials. The associations remained actively engaged in our works. We can build on that uh, expert industry engagement uh, to assist the colleges and, and their other tech grant partners in established an improved recognition of NIMS credentials in recruiting, hiring, and retaining the tech participants and others. And lastly, we, we could uh, would suggest that we could help work with you to uh, embed the NIMS credentials into the career pathways uh, at the colleges um, and uh, uh, tie that to it, associate degrees and other uh, four credit pathways. Um, we stand ready to support you in the development of a stackable credential portfolio that integrates NIMS certifications into the recognized and accredited pathways established at the community colleges. Thank you for that, Jim. Uh, sorry to almost slip by us, but no uh, that's helpful. Um, so I'd like to move along to Dennis Harwig um, from the American Welding Society. Uh, Dennis, are you there? I am here. Great. Dennis, can you tell us a little bit about the American Welding Society and who you represent? Yes, can Next you advance slide, the slide, please? please? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, the American Welding Society strategic goal is to support industry through membership. AWS has over 71,000 members that are divided into districts, sections, and student chapters. These membership forums provide great opportunities for industry networking and career enlightenment. AWS members get a range of additional benefits. Certification, AWS offers a range of personnel and facility qualifications. I'll get into this later. Education, AWS provides over 120 exam preparation seminars annually and develops and produces advanced, media-rich e-courses for knowledge and growth. Conferences, AWS hosts a range of engineering conferences that serve the emerging needs of key industries on an annual basis. Expositions, AWS and its partners host the annual Fabtech show that has over 40,000 attendees. This year's show is in Atlanta in November. Foundation and scholarship, AWS issues almost a half a million dollars a year in scholarships and supports a number of initiatives to promote careers in welding. Publications, AWS publishes the Welding Journal, which has a research supplement for academics and inspection trend magazines. Codes and standards, AWS was founded in 1919 to create industry standards to assure quality in everything we build using welding and allied technologies. Today, AWS operates 29 major committees and publishes approximately 230 industry standards. AWS is world-renowned for its structural welding codes, which are adopted by almost every state's building code. And then interactive website. AWS is monitoring its IT platform and web services, and in the future, a key focus will be providing career management services to its members. Next slide. Okay, what kind of jobs do you have available? And how do they lend to community college training? Um, there's major demand for welding and allied technology crafts. There are over a million jobs in welding. 
Uh, welding and allied technologies are core to metal products and structure manufacturers and key construction trades such as iron workers, sheet metal workers, pipe fitters, plumbers, steam fitters, boiler makers, just to name a few. Um, these fields are forecasted to grow 15% in the next decade. When considering attrition, industry is forecasted to need an additional 400,000 welding-related craft workers by 2024. A natural growth pathway for many welding craft workers is a certified welding inspector. AWS has over 40,000 certified welding inspectors that act as quality supervisors in a range of industries. Next slide. Welding-related industries offer a range of advanced career pathways that require incremental levels of advanced welding technology and or engineering education. AWS offers certifications for the most important welding roles, which include the Certified Welder, CW, Certified Robotic Arc Welding Technician, CRAWT, Certified Resistance Welding Technician, CWRT, Certified Radiographic Interpreter, CRI, Certified Welding Inspector, CWI, Certified Senior or Senior Certified Welding Inspector, SCWI, Certified Welding Supervisor, CWS, Certified Welding Technologist, CWT, Certified Welding Engineer, CWENG, Certified Welding Sales Rep, CWSR, and Certified Welding Educator, CWE. So I think you kind of understand our acronym system by now. Um, yeah. All AWS certification exams are competency-based and not linked to a specific curriculum or diploma. So we don't care uh, where you get your education. It's just can you demonstrate competency. Welding career pathways require a sound foundation in technology. This includes strong competencies in drafting and design, fabrication math, process technologies, metallurgy and inspection technology. All personnel qualification standards define the body of knowledge and job competencies where colleges can align their courses to support these professional pathways. Community colleges are well placed to build relationships with industry and tailor welding career programs to meet these needs. Next slide. So, how might community colleges best partner with you to prepare students for industry recognized credentials and, and job demands? Yeah, uh, Jackie, can you advance one, one slide forward? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. So, next slide. So AWS recommends implementing an integrated sense and accredited test facility certified water program as a starting point. And I think we went ahead one slide too fast, didn't we? Did we got we got a backup one? Um, right we there. have one. Yeah. Okay. Yep, right there. So and then so so AWS recommends implementing an integrated sense and accredited test facility program for as a starting point. Sense is an acronym for school schools excelling through National Skills Standards Education. The SENSE Welding Skills Standard was developed to support standard requirements for Perkins funding. There are two levels, SENSE Level 1, which is Entry Level Welder, and SENSE Level 2, which is Advanced Welder. AWS offers a national exam for each level and offers a national registry where completers register their certificates for both levels. The SENSE certificates indicate a range of knowledge and skill, qualification, competencies, the welding technology, Fundamentals that I mentioned earlier are taught in SENSE and are core to all career pathways in the welding industry. The SENSE program, if, if the SENSE program is also an accredited test facility, the skill qualification requirements can be substituted for certified welder test. Hence, two or more credentials can be produced in one program. AWS accredits facilities to certify welders to major construction codes. These facilities are designated accredited test facilities. So the ATF, or Credit Test Facility, issues AWS certified welder cards for a wide range of industrial code applications, such as American Welding Society structural codes, American Society of Mechanical Engineers boiler and pressure vessel codes, American Petroleum Institute pipeline codes. To operate an accredited test facility, instructors need to hold a certified welding educator and certified welding inspector certifications and or have consultant arrangements with partners. Colleges pursuing TAC grants should budget for training and certifying instructors <clears throat> and accrediting their facilities for the accredited test facility program. Next slide. And one, one more. Hey, um, Jim, we, we've got um, about a minute and a half remaining for this okay. session. Okay. And then so the, I think we're, we're on to the last slide then, too. I think I move forward. I just want to – AWS also recommends implementing programs for associate's degree in welding technology. The National Science Foundation has funded a center of excellence in welding technology named WeldEd, 
Wellhead has developed a summer seminar series to provide curriculum and training for instructors who seek to implement or improve welding technology programs. The Wellhead curriculum can support professional pathway development for a range of careers as defined earlier. Colleges pursuing TAC grants should budget for attending Wellhead instructor training programs. And again, that's it for AWS and my resource. I mean, my contact information is, is on the resource sheet, and AWS welcomes the opportunity to assist community colleges develop initiatives that will impact welding, joining, and allied technology industries. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to, we are a little short on time, but I, I did want to make sure we asked uh, sort of a core question that was asked from the last section. Um, how much do, what kind of wages do uh, student workers pull in when they finish a community college training with you? In welding? Uh, yes, I, I actually, and it's also for, for Jim and Paige as well. Okay. Well, in the welding industry, most welders starting with salaries between, you know, thirty to 40000 a year, 15 to $20 an hour. But, you know, depending on if you get into the, the, the organized labor areas, those guys make typically thirty-seven fifty an hour or more, and, and so they're making 75000 or more a year plus overtime. So a lot of those guys break six figures. And uh -huh. then uh, in, in, as far as in, like a certified welding inspector, probably then your, your, your hourly rate's more around 30, 30 to $40 an hour, so six, uh, 60 to you know, $80,000 a year. Um, so I wanted to also make sure Jim and Paige got a chance to answer that quickly. Um, any response there from you? Sure. This, this is Paige um, from HBI, Home Builders Institute. And um, I have some statistics from 2012, the median annual wages. Um, it looks like you know, they're running anywhere from $30,000 to $40,000 with the trades uh, starting. And then the supervisors, which is like the superintendent series that we mentioned, can be anywhere between fifty and sixty thousand um, dollars. Carpenters are going to be the the most um, in numbers of the people that you have, and they're close to forty thousand dollars a year. Uh, Jim, quickly, do you have a response to that? In, in precision manufacturing, uh, there is a pretty wide variation nationally, depending on uh, what region you're in. But typically, we see wages. Uh, beginning at the $15, $16 an hour, and, and that can progress up to, uh, depending on where you are, uh, $25, $30 an hour. And, and with experience, after you know three or four years' experience, um, those numbers can go up rather significantly. Thank you very much for that. Um, I would like to thank our audience for joining us. And I want to, one, uh, there are some resources. Could we go back past one, one slide? Thank you. Um, on our web page, Skills for America's Future, uh, there will be a resource page. And within 24 hours, again, we will have the recording of this webinar up and available for folks. Um, there is also information on the TAC grants at the Department of Labor website. Um, we also, and this will be available on the resource sheet, we have here email addresses, uh, excuse me, not email addresses, uh, websites for all of our participant organizations today. Um, I'd like to thank each of them for joining us and telling us a bit about their organizations, and most importantly, how they can partner with you to help uh, form a more robust tax grant and to help you meet your goals. Um, we want to thank all of you for joining us for this webinar, and we are now going to sign off. Thank you very much. <laughs>